what, uh, what Pete does for us. He's a graduate of Haverford College and the University of Wisconsin School of Law, where he got both an LLB and an SJD. So I feel like I really should call you Dr. Davis. Nobody does. <laughs> uh, the second speaker is me, uh, and I've already been introduced, so I'll, I'll move on uh, from there. Our third speaker will be Nancy Hawk, who's at the end of the table here. Nancy is a graduate of our law school, class of 1979. She's counsel uh, in the Office of General Counsel for the University of Missouri System. Uh, she received both her undergraduate and law degrees uh, here at the University of Missouri, practiced with the AG's office before joining the uh, General Counsel's office, where she focuses on a variety of federal law issues, including copyright. Uh, our final speaker, uh, who's in the middle uh, at, at the table, it's Catherine Early. She is director and senior corporate counsel at LexisNexis Publishing in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, she went to George Washington University for her undergrad and received a JD and an MBA from Ohio State University. She was a litigator uh, before joining LexisNexis, and she's also been an adjunct professor at Wright State University in Ohio. And so, without any further ado, I introduce Pete Davis. Thank you. Morning. I've been uh, teaching IP at this university since I introduced the topic to the curriculum in 1980. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the areas, uh, a, a piece of copyright law. Uh, you may recall that the uh, <clears throat> Missouri State Court of Appeals decided a case dealing with the ownership of faculty syllabi. Uh, in August, uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk about that, and I'm also going to talk about faculty lectures, the ones that are not written down but are spoken, and whether the faculty member has a copyright in that type of oral work. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that first because I wrote it up first. Um, as background, a statutory copyright is available under the Federal Copyright Act if it is a work in a fixed medium of expression. We're talking about books, manuscripts, paintings, sculptures, maps, sound recordings, uh, recorded broadcasts, and the like. They're all fixed. They are tangible. You can pick them up. Well, I guess a recorded broadcast, you can pick up the recording. Um, we do have not required a statutory notice, like I put at the bottom of my page, um, since 1989. Uh, so notice uh, is not a prerequisite. That means that the, as soon as the work is fixed, it's automatically protected by copyright. The duration these days, as a result of the uh, help of Walt Disney, uh, is, 20, is the life of the author plus 70 years. But, uh, and that would protect uh, articles written by faculty members or other people. Uh, it would protect books and the like, uh, but we're talking about lectures. And those are not fixed. They are spoken, or to use the, uh, the technical language, they are uttered. Um, and that is not protected by federal law, uh, and that leaves the common law. So the question is, is there any common law copyright in oral remarks? Uh, there are uh, maybe a little bit of common law copyright still remaining because the federal act says it doesn't, that works that are not covered by the federal act can be covered by the common law or by state law. So that's what we're going to look at. And the case you look at, this is what all the commentators tell us, is the state of Hemingway versus Random House. This was a case decided uh, in 1968 where Hemingway's biographer conducted extensive interviews with Hemingway and Hemingway liked to talk a lot and he had a lot to say and the biographer took notes and uh, then later in his biography after Hemingway died he quoted uh, Hemingway's remarks and uh, his estate, I assume that means his daughter probably, or perhaps his wife, took umbrage uh, at doing this without paying royalties and sued. And the issue then was, was there anything to protect? And the court concluded 
that um, <clears throat> the Federal Act doesn't protect conversations uh, because the work had to be in a fixed medium of expression. That was true under the 199 Act. It's still true under the 76 Act. Um, but that what Hemingway said, because he was an eloquent speaker, uh, these remarks could be thought of as literary creations. That's what the estate argued. And the court says, well, maybe, maybe, but a person who hears his conversation has to know what it is that Hemingway is uh, purporting to protect. So the, the remarks that are protectable have to be somehow delineated. And Hemingway was just babbling on, and uh, he didn't delineate anything. So uh, Hemingway stands for the proposition that oral works, oral conversations that is delineated might be protectable, but it's not a holding. Well, is there anything else? Well, Reverend Fall, Jerry Falwell had uh, conversations with a journalist, uh, and uh, the journalist uh, ended up um, uh, writing down some of those remarks, and they ended up in an article in Penthouse magazine. And as you might guess, Reverend Falwell was not pleased about where this, these remarks ended up, and so he sued, arguing that uh, his copyright had been uh, infringed, and uh, Penthouse went down the same road that Hemingway went down and said, well, uh, Falwell didn't indicate what he was trying to protect, what he didn't. Uh, interesting, they didn't cite the Hemingway case, which is earlier, uh, but anyway, it stands for the same proposition. Now, that tells us then that uh, we have no case that expressly holds that oral remarks are protectable, but that if they are protectable, they have to be delineated. And the uh, intellectual property commentators, you look at all the case books, you look at all the horn books, you look at all the treatises, they all say, oh yeah, Hemingway suggestion uh, that oral works are protectable, if delineated, is probably good law. But you all see the word probably because no court has expressly held that. So, uh, and I concur with that proposition, and therefore, I think faculty lectures are cl classic examples of delineated oral remarks, because there's a beginning and an end to the lecture in the classroom, uh, so they're locationally delineated, they're um, structurally or format delineated, and therefore they ought to be protected. But you see, I say ought, because no court has expressly held. There are a couple of other cases we could look at, but um, I think the most interesting thing that has happened is that California has enacted legislation that protects uh, any original work of authorship that's not fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So it, uh, the lectures would be protected in California. Uh, and the uh, Congress has gone down the same road with respect to uh, extemporaneous music. Uh, and that stuff can't be pro uh, reproduced by other people without permission. All right, let's now talk about the case that the university was involved in um, this year and has to do with syllabi. Uh, we all, all, we, all faculty members tend to hand out syllabi uh, giving the students an idea of the organization of the course and what they're going to read and all that, and they're often uh, set up as uh, sort of mini outlines of the subject. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, this organization, the National Council for Teachers Quality, uh, wanted to collect syllabi in order to analyze the quality of teaching at uh, various public universities, and they sued Minnesota and they sued us. I'll talk about our suit first because it's the last one. Uh, they sought these syllabi under this uh, open records <laughs> law that we have here in Missouri, or we call it the Sunshine Law. And uh, it authorizes, uh, actually requires that all public records be made available unless uh, they're protected from disclosure by law. And the argument the university made was that the Copyright Act bars the university from disclosing the syllabuses to other people without the consent of the faculty member, which uh, 
NCTQ didn't ask the faculty members for these things, they asked the university. So uh, the issue is, must the university disclose these syllabi to the, uh, uh, <coughs> the NCTQ? And the answer uh, the court said was no. Why not? Uh, because uh, the court said the syllabi are owned by the individual faculty members, not by the university. Uh, and that, without saying that there is a copyright in syllabi, because um, the court said, oh, we're a state court, we can't talk about federal law, uh, they uh, certainly implied that there was a copyright and it was owned by the faculty members. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the court right? And the answer is yes. And you uh, get the uh, answer from the work for hire rules that are built into the Copyright Act. There are two kinds of situations where the work for hire rules apply. The first is where an employee of uh, somebody uh, prepares the work uh, as part of his duties uh, in, as an employee. And so we'll have to look and see, is a university professor an employee? Well, of course, strictly speaking, the answer is yes. I mean, where's the salary come from? Uh, we, they withhold taxes, they do all that kind of stuff. Uh, the university professor is not a, uh, an independent contractor, but we use the uh, typical common law factors for determining who's an employee to determine whether the person is an employee for purposes of the work for hire rules. And uh, we could say, you know, if you're working for extension preparing brochures or you're working for uh, university media and you're preparing advertisements and the like, yeah, sure, that's all an employee situation. But that means that the work is being supervised closely by the, a, by the employer, and that is not what happens in the academic context. Uh, nobody tells me what I am to say in my courses, what I am to put on my syllabus. All I am told is, teach intellectual property or teach copyrights. Well, that's hardly close supervision. So that first category doesn't work. Second category, are specially commissioned works, um, like uh, somebody, uh, an orchestra commissions a new work to be played um, at some special concert. Well, there are only seven categories of specially commissioned work that where uh, the work for hire rule will apply and that the uh, person commissioning the work gets the copyright. And uh, you see the list there. Uh, do you see anything that looks like uh, university teaching? Answer, no. Uh, therefore, and actually specially commissioned music doesn't fall within the seven categories. You'll notice movies are in here. Uh, that's probably the result of the influence of the movie industry in Congress. Uh, but anyway, um, so university syllabi aren't of that character either. That's the list of common law factors that you look at. Uh, and so the conclusion has to be that the work for hire rules don't apply to university faculty members because university faculty members prepare the work, uh, the syllabi themselves. Um, it's an aspect of academic freedom, actually, and academic tradition. And there are a couple of cases that uh, agree that university teachers are not employees or subject to the work for hire rules. Um, uh, even though the Copyright Act, when it was amended in 1976, eliminated the express uh, exemption of teachers from work for hire that existed in the 1909 Act. So, the conclusion we have to reach is the work for hire rules decree, if you will, that uh, university, that, that faculty prepared syllabi are owned by the faculty member, not by the university. Now, the uh, next question, uh, by the way, uh, University of Minnesota was sued uh, by NCTQ as well, uh, and they reached a different result, but it had to do with the fair use doctrine, which we'll look at in just right now. Um, 
is it fair use for the university to copy the syllabi without the consent of the faculty members? Because the uh, Copyright Act provides for fair use. Uh, it is uh, defined as a privilege in others to uh, use the copyrighted material in a reasonable manner without the consent of the copyright owner. And uh, the purposes that are listed in the act, though that's not uh, yeah, an inclusive list, it's an exclusive list. There could be others. I have had some trouble finding other purposes besides these five. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, and scholarship or research. NCTQ argued in both the Missouri and Minnesota cases that it was doing research on teacher quality and therefore the syllabi uh, was, uh, could be copied and uh, delivered to them. Uh, of course, the problem was it wasn't the university's um, uh, thing and uh, the fair use doctrine might well apply if the NCTQ got copies of the uh, syllabi from the teachers. Uh, but asking a third party, the university, to hand them over uh, doesn't work under the fair use doctrine. Uh, but we also have uh, a couple of cases that, or at least one case in particular, uh, that uh, addresses the question. We're talking here not about copying a piece of the syllabi, we're talking about copying the entire thing. And we have an, a case that involves an analogy uh, the issue of copying research articles in their entirety. Individual researchers can do that under the fair use doctrine. Uh, it's not only, uh, uh, I think we've got cases that say that, certainly the publisher's guidelines say that's okay, but can the university copy research articles and then hand them over to their uh, professors and the answer is no, uh, that uh, it's not fair use to do mass copying. American Geophysical case involved a uh, publisher of uh, scholarly journals and uh, the court in that case said that uh, this mass copying by the, uh, I forget, I think it was uh, one of the oil companies uh, copying stuff for their uh, research employees, that was a no-no, uh, and they had to pay royalties. So, I think that's analogous to copying the entirety of syllabi, analogous to the situation of the university being asked to copy them and send them off to NCTQ, and uh, that's not fair use. Uh, all right, so there we are. Um, two conclusions. Faculty members own the co uh, copyright in their oral lectures because they are delineated uh, and that uh, it's generally accepted in the IP community that uh, you can have a copyright in an oral delineated remarks even though we have no case that expressly holds that. And secondly, uh, faculty members own the copyright in their syllabi, not the university and it's not fair use for the university to copy them all uh, and, uh, and collect them, even though uh, it might be fair use for somebody like a student to make a copy and give it to another student. All right. I think uh, Pete shared with you some, uh, some good news about uh, faculty ownership rights, and uh, so I think that uh, he's the good cop, so I guess that makes me the bad cop. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, issues that arise by way of limitations uh, and defenses uh, in the area of copyright law. And uh, where I'll begin is uh, with, with what I call my top ten list, which hopefully is, uh, is about to go up. Thank you. Yep. So uh, this is my top 10 list of copyright myths. And essentially, I think of these as uh, pieces of information that, that often float out there about copyright law that are either not true or not completely accurate. Uh, and I wanted to start by sharing this bit of bad news with you. 
Uh, so, uh, for starters, giving proper credit is sufficient to avoid copyright infringement. A lot of people incorporate rules of plagiarism which essentially say, uh, you know, if you quote somebody, you have to attribute, that's academic honesty, that that somehow is also a rule in copyright law. So imagine if I copy wholesale uh, some sort of creative work, uh, and then I say at the end, I've copied this uh, from this source, and this is the author. Well, that does not serve as a defense in copyright law for my reproduction of that work. So even though that rule is a good one for purposes of academic honesty, it isn't a good rule uh, in copyright. A second uh, myth is that if something's emailed, posted, or otherwise available on the internet, uh, it's therefore in the public domain and can be copied without charge or uh, other permission. And uh, the challenge here is that it is true that it's easy to copy things off the internet. People do this all the time. But that doesn't mean uh, that there's not a copyright violation that occurs. You don't waive your right to a copyright by virtue of having material on the internet. Now maybe, again, a good idea as a copyright owner to not have your material easily duplicated via the internet. Uh, but just because you do that doesn't mean that you've lost your rights under federal copyright law. Pete mentioned this point. Uh, prior to 1989, it was true that copyright notice was mandatory to a large extent, uh, that you had to essentially say uh, at the, uh, the beginning of your work that you were claiming copyright, and you had the C with the circle around it, uh, the name of the author and the year the work was published. But that rule has not been in place since 1989, which coincidentally was the year I first started teaching. Uh, and back then, you know, the, 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 there wasn't the electronic stuff that we have now. Uh, the world has changed in a lot of ways. Uh, but uh, this is the rule for the last 26 or so years. Uh, you don't need a copyright notice. Now again, if you're a copyright owner, is it a good idea for you to put people on notice that you're claiming a copyright? Absolutely. But if you fail to do so, you've not lost your rights. A fourth point, uh, many people are aware that there is a copyright registration system. The U.S. Copyright Office uh, registers uh, and, and records copyrights and transfers of copyrights. And there certainly, at times, is a need to go and register, in particular, uh, in general, before you file suit in federal court. You do have to register your copyright. But it is not necessary to have a registration in order to have copyright protection. As Pete mentioned, as soon as that work is in some tangible form, it's written down, it's recorded, it's stored on the hard drive, uh, it is protected under federal copyright law. A fifth point, and I said I was the bearer of some bad news. I think there's sometimes the assumption that if you're engaged in classroom teaching, you can just photocopy whatever you want or, and duplicate whatever you want electronically and just get it out there uh, and that you never have to worry about copyright. And unfortunately, that's not the case, as we'll see in a few moments. A similar point, uh, it's often said that as long as the use is nonprofit, somehow there won't be a copyright issue. Again, there's no absolute blanket rule uh, that says that. There are some very specific things that certain nonprofit organizations can do, but uh, this blanket rule is, is another example of something uh, that you wouldn't want to rely on. Point seven is one that I often hear. Uh, I bought this work, therefore I can do whatever I want with it. And so uh, the idea here is, for example, if I buy a, uh, a music download or a music CD, those who still buy CDs, uh, I can then uh, play that music in my large public venue. Well, as a matter of fact, you probably can't do that, at least unless you have a specific exemption uh, that would violate the public performance right under copyright law. So even though you may well own that and you can listen to it uh, in the privacy of your home or in your car or in your office or in certain exempt settings, you don't have a blanket right uh, to make use of it in any way you chose even though you did purchase that work. Rule uh, or point eight 
I added something. I took a John Grisham novel and I wrote a new conclusion to it. And I think it's better than, than John's were. Well, John's publisher isn't going to be very pleased with that. And even though I might have added a final chapter, what I think is a better ending, uh, that still can be an infringement of uh, the copyright in that book. Now, I said this is generally bad news. You know, it, it is also true, uh, or, or what I should say is, you know, it's often said that getting permission under copyright is, is something that can't be done. The internet has made this a lot easier to do. It may not be something, and I understand this, that you want to do, but many of the uses that you might want to make of a work are now things that can be licensed, the permissions can be had, you can identify copyright owners a lot more easily, you can find various organizations that help clear those rights. And lastly, and this is one I hear quite a bit, people often say, well, no one's really policing this stuff anyway, I'm not going to get caught doing uh, my, whatever infringing act I might uh, carry out. And this reminds me of uh, Ellen de Graffenried's discussion. You know, there, there probably was a point at which there was more truth to this, uh, but today you can Google, uh, you can search, you can find out what's going on at the University in Mexico that she mentioned right on the internet. Uh, and there are many enforcers and owners of copyrights who engage in this kind of daily weekly, regular monitoring uh, to assess whether there's a copyright infringement taking place. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the last one that I will mention. So uh, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, uh, I want to say a couple things uh, about copyright generally. Uh, it's a constitutionally based uh, uh, set of law. It's right there in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution that authorizes the enactment of copyright laws. Uh, Congress has carried out uh, its authority to exercise that uh, in various copyright laws uh, that are generally framed as the Copyright Act of 1976. Uh, this slide gives you an illustration of uh, some of the types of works that are protected by copyright. A lot of them are obvious, uh, literary works such as books, musical works, plays, choreographies, pictures, sculptures, sound recordings, uh, and most recently added uh, architectural works are protected under copyright law. Now, I know most of what I've said so far has sounded like bad news. Here's a slide that tells you not everything is protected under copyright law. It's only copyrightable expression, uh, the, the sort of particular way that, a, a, that words are expressed or that the song might be written. Uh, things that are not protected include ideas, procedures, processes, systems, et cetera. You can go down the list. Uh, so uh, you take the formula E equals MC squared. Uh, that is not something that's copyrightable. It's an idea. Uh, it, it's a formula. Uh, but if you write a book about uh, the uh, use of atomic energy, uh, the book that you write is a creative expression, and the text uh, is protected under copyright law. So that's, a, that's an important distinction uh, to keep in mind. I'm not really going to go through this slide. There are a variety of rights that copyright owners have. If we had more time, I'd talk more about them. Uh, but in general, mo the most obvious violation occurs when you reproduce a copyrighted work or we, when you take a copyrighted work and turn it into a new work without permission. For example, if I make a movie based on a published novel, uh, that, copyrighted, uh, that copyright owner can assert a violation of the uh, right to create a derivative work. Now that really brings me to uh, the main thing I want to talk about today. Pete mentioned it, uh, the fair use defense. And, and I, I, I generally don't like slides like this with lots of information on them, although I have a couple uh, in this presentation. But I do want to focus in a little bit on the language of the Copyright Act, because I think a lot of folks have a sense of this fair use defense that's based on the first sentence in this statute. And there's a lot of verbiage. Uh, but if you go through here, the fair use of a copyrighted work, including reproduction and copies, or by any other means, uh, and Pete mentioned this list of, of various purposes that are protected. 
criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research is not an infringement of copyright. Well, a lot of folks read that first sentence and stop. And if you read that first sentence, it does sound as if there's this really broad fair use defense that pretty much lets you do any of these favored uh, purpose type activities without worrying about copyright law. Unfortunately, that's not the whole statute. That's not the whole provision. And that's why we have this long thing that probably ought to be on two slides. What you have to do in order to assess fair use is you have to do what lawyers call a case-by-case -case balancing. You have to take a series of factors, the four factors that are identified here, and really it's more than four, because if you parse out the language in this statute, there are a number of factual considerations that go into the mix. And I think of it a little bit like taking a bunch of ingredients and throwing them into a blender uh, and, and blending it up and then seeing whether it tastes good or not. Uh, in other words, it's really hard to predict. I make smoothies at home every now and then, and sometimes I pull things out of the freezer, I'm not sure how long they've been in there, and I, I throw them in, and sometimes it doesn't come out as good as I would have thought. And, and I think of fair use as being a little bit like my, my blended drink. Uh, it may or may not come out the way you'd like it uh, to be. So I'm going to break this out a little bit, uh, looking at these fair use factors. Uh, as, we, as we talked about earlier, there are these favored purposes. That weighs in favor, but it's just basically like <laughs> one, uh, one little element, one little uh, 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 piece of weight on, on the favored side. We'll also look at whether it's for profit or non-profit. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is not an absolute, but it is a factor that gets taken into account. Uh, you look at the character of the taking, whether it was in good faith uh, or not. I'll mention a case in a minute that illustrates that. And you look at whether there's transformation, whether there's new material, new additions. But again, none of these are automatics. These are just things to be weighed in the balance. This is just a little bit of light relief here. Uh, and, and it highlights what I think my conclusion is going to be about how often you can really rely on the fair use defense, and I, I'll see if I'll convince you that that's true. The second factor, you also look at the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it published or is it unpublished? There's more use allowed if it's published. Is it fact or fiction? You can take things out of factual or historical works. Uh, you can make more use of them because of the nature of that, because those are not really created by the author. They're simply facts or historical uh, items. Uh, a fictional work gets more protection because it's the creation of the author. Uh, and that's really the third point as well. Third factor, amount and substantiality. How much was taken uh, in, in a qualitative sense and in a quantitative sense? Now, at this point, we're not done. We have one more factor to look at, but I'm going to give you an illustration. You might wonder, what does Gerald Ford have to do with fair use? Well, former President Ford wrote this book, A Time to Heal. It's a really long book. I, I, I have to say, and, you know, it's 446 pages long, and I've, I've never read it. One of these days, maybe I will. Why is this case up here? Uh, because Harper and Rowe uh, was the publisher of this book. And uh, as the book was coming out, one of the things that you can do in, in this publishing industry is you can market uh, what is essentially a licensed excerpt. And there was going to be a licensed excerpt that was going to go into Time Magazine's uh, issue. And Time was going to pay a fair amount of money to the publisher for use of this excerpt. But before the excerpt could be uh, uh, published by Time Magazine, uh, a, a stolen copy of this manuscript uh, found its way into the hands of the editor of The Nation magazine. That editor grabbed the manuscript, flipped through it, looked for uh, what he thought were the highlights of the book, and he quoted 
about 300 words. And let me, let me say that again. 300 words out of this 400 plus page book. And he published that in his, uh, in his magazine, in Nation Magazine. Harper and Rowe then lost its lucrative deal with Time Magazine because the scoop was already out. The excerpt was already out there. They were not willing to pay uh, for uh, the use of that work. The lawsuit ensued. And this suit was a very closely divided, really close case. But the United States Supreme Court ruled that that four, three, four hundred page excerpt was not a fair use in this instance. Now think about this for a moment. This is a, pub well, at this point it was not a published work, which is important, but it was a factual or historical work by a public figure, former president. Uh, it was published by the Nation magazine, which is a news reporting outlet. Remember the discussion we've had. You would think, well, that sounds like something that might be a fair use. Why was it not? Well, number one, it was a stolen manuscript. And the court said that that shows bad faith, and that weighed against the use. It was an unpublished work at that point in time. That weighed against fair use. Even though it was only three or 400 words, the court said that the heart of the work was taken qualitatively, the key passages you might guess in this 440-page book, uh, the editor flipped through looking for, among other things, uh, President Ford's discussion of his pardon of former President Nixon. And that was one of the things that the court said was the heart of the book. And that's what was quoted. And lastly, there was an effect on the potential market. And that was uh, that the Time Magazine contract was lost by virtue of this infringement. And so the court concluded that this use by a news reporting entity uh, was not a fair use. And to me, that's the, the biggest illustration of how unpredictable fair use is. And just to give you an idea, the lower court, the trial court, uh, said it was a fair use. Uh, the, uh, the Second Circuit was split two to one. Uh, and the Supreme Court also split. I think it was six to three or seven to two. So even among the judges and justices who heard the case, there was a disagreement, which shows you just how unpredictable fair use can be. My, my bottom line point is uh, that it's very hard to assess the outcome of fair use analysis. It's very costly to litigate. And so one thing you want to think about is whether there's a better alternative, uh, unless you're very confident that your use qualifies as a fair use. So I'm going to stop there and uh, uh, thank you very much. As the Dean mentioned, my name is Nancy Hawk. I'm at the uh, University's General Counsel's Office and have been there for 30 years. Uh, just to give you a brief overview, that office handles the legal representation for all four campuses and the business operations of the university. Uh, a part of the university I knew absolutely nothing about as a student, but come to uh, become acquainted with it over the last 30 years. And I'm glad that I have received an invitation to come talk here because uh, I do know a little bit about the IP practice at the General Counsel's Office, and um, I can tell you that it's, uh, it's a tilt-to-whirl carnival ride. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun ride uh, with um, occasional bouts of queasiness. Uh, and the reason is that it's very fast moving. Uh, it's a, uh, we are in a very rich IP environment. The law is changing constantly. And uh, so it makes for a very fast-paced uh, and interesting area to practice in. Uh, so let me just uh, give you some glimpses of some of the issues that, uh, that come up in our office from time to time. 
Um, as I mentioned, it's a rich IP environment, so we're dealing with visual arts, we're dealing with music, we're dealing with written content, uh, software, uh, and starting with, uh, with the area of visual arts, um, we actually get quite a lot of questions that come up about use of fine art in uh, electronic publications. Um, we, uh, we all know that art adds a lot to websites and audiovisual works. Uh, some of our faculty like to use it uh, in a lot of different ways. And of course, the analysis of the, the uh, uh, permissibility of that varies based upon all the facts. But um, what, interestingly, of course, we, we're seeing in the digital age these vast warehouses of digital images, like Corbis, which uh, has 800,000, uh, owns the right to 800,000 digital images of fine art and uh, Getty Images uh, with their vast warehouse of digital rights to photographs. And um, we, because of the uh, cyber trolls, we often find ourselves on the defensive when somebody has uh, put up what they thought was, was an innocent use of a photograph or a protected piece of art, and suddenly we're in a position where we have to defend uh, uh, our use of that from an automatic letter that went out from the cyber troll. Uh, and again, it's all, always very fact specific. It takes some time to look at it and decide whether it's uh, something that we can defend or not. Um, and it's also an opportunity to uh, re-educate ourselves on this and help our clients understand some of the ramifications of these things. But when it occurs outside of the traditional classroom teaching, obviously, it gets a little more difficult to defend and we have to work on it a little bit. Um, in the area of music, uh, music makes practically everything better, but it is a nightmare of copyright, layers of rights. Uh, it's no coincidence that the main treatise on this, Cone on Music Licensing, is over 1,600 pages long. And there's, it's a good reason for it, because uh, music can have uh, many layers of rights. You can have performance rights, you can have synchronization rights if you want to set music to motion, you can have master rights. Uh, there's a separate right uh, in a sound recording, copyright for sound recording than there is for the underlying composition. There are mechanical rights. And it is extremely difficult to get these kinds of permissions. Uh, uh, depending on which one you're looking for, it's also difficult to figure out which ones you need. Um, and it's unfortunate because music does make things better. But it's tightly policed. And, um, we, again, we often find ourselves on the defensive when someone uses it in a way that causes offense to the rights holders. Um, in the area of, uh, uh, of written content, um, obviously, again, we're talking about some very fact-specific analyses. Um, one of the things that we try to do when uh, we get a complaint from a right holder about someone in the administration or faculty or uh, uh, business area is using some content. We try to figure out um, if our use is not just a fair use, but what rights are being uh, uh, implicated. Um, is our person infringing or potentially infringing upon the copyright owner's exclusive right to uh, reproduce the work or modify the work or uh, perform the work, uh, distribute the work, modify the work? And only once we go through all those analyses can we figure out a good way to advise them on the extent to which that they, they can use it. Um, in the area of software, Atlantic Connecticut in our office is handling those issues. Obviously, that's a very uh, rapidly expanding field, and it's got its own uh, uh, analysis and uh, takes quite a lot of time uh, because it's an area that is growing so quickly. Um, one of the things that we get a lot of questions about are um, license agreements that, uh, on, the, on the business side of things, people are asked to sign off on to allow them to use certain content. These are often very difficult to interpret, and they often have some very difficult terms for us to agree to. Um, they may have our uh, mandatory arbitration terms in them, and they may have indemnification terms in them. Both of these can impact the university's uh, immunities. And <clears throat> this is an area that gets a lot of discussion in our uh, National Association of College of University Attorneys because uh, 
our people want to be able to use these things, and yet, uh, as a public university, we have an obligation to preserve our immunities, and they can be threatened if we agree to certain of these terms, at least without some modification of the terms. Um, but it sometimes seems like the, the rights holders have all the bargaining power, so it puts, puts us all in a difficult position. Um, we get a lot of questions on just how to read them. Um, the, the, the label royalty-free can really trip people up, and I get a lot of questions about this, because if they see uh, something that uh, describes itself as a royalty-free license, they may not understand that they still have to pay a flat fee, and uh, they get lured into these things and, and then accused of infringement because it's, it's hard to, uh, it's, it's not intuitive to think that you have to pay for something with the word free in it, and yet oftentimes we do. Um, in the area of uh, interpreting the fair use doctrine, as the dean describes, it is difficult. It's difficult for everybody. It's difficult for the courts. Um, Georgia State has spent the last seven years defending itself against Cambridge Press and other academic presses uh, for its practice in uh, putting articles on electronic reserve for the benefit of the faculty and their students. Uh, this has been a real long haul for that uh, piece of litigation. It's, it's now on remand back to the district court after the appellate court uh, reversed the, the holdings uh, of the lower court and it's asking, it is requiring the district court to reevaluate um, the way that it analyzed the, uh, the, the articles. Um, and so we're seeing, even with among the courts, that they're all struggling to apply this doctrine. Um, it also illustrates the tension, particularly in a university environment, where you know, our argument is we're just trying to get the information out there to further our educational process. And the academic presses are saying, look, if you people don't buy these things, where are we going to sell them? I mean, they're not going to go on sale at Walmart, so you know, we've got to protect our own stuff. Uh, a very difficult and probably an ongoing uh, tension between uh, two parties. We'll see where Georgia comes out on that. Um, another area that is uh, uh, constantly changing and needs a lot of analysis is the use of work in distance education. We often hear uh, that distance education is going to be kind of the answer to all the problems of higher ed, and yet we know as copyright attorneys how limited um, presentation of material can be in a distance learning context because copyright law is not the same for that as it is in the face-to-face -face classroom teaching where basically you can do anything. You can show an entire movie, you can do whatever you want. That isn't really true in distance education. There are many limitations and um, the, uh, you know, Congress tried to address it with the TEACH Act in 2002 but it, by its own terms, is also very limiting to the, to the extent that it uh, really doesn't permit uh, use of video uh, over uh, in a distance education uh, learning environment or dramatic uh, audio works. And that's why uh, in this area, again, we will often look to fair use and try to see if there's a defensible way to use some material. But, um, Still, a difficult analysis. Um, finally, uh, an area that is uh, sort of unique to the academic world, certainly not common in an industry, is our, our own ownership uh, rules on copyright. Um, you know, in, 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 in industry, you'll probably be asked to sign away anything you ever write before you're even shown to your cubicle, and that is not true in the academic setting and it's not true at the University of Missouri, uh, where we have rules that state that even if the university um, asserts ownership, that we still share in the revenue that is uh, derived from external use of those works. And the university only asserts ownership in works if they are commissioned by the university or they uh, are generated as a result of a grant in which the production of the writing is required, or if it's produced by someone whose specific responsibility it is to produce written works, um, or if substantial university resources are used. And here we're usually talking about some fairly expensive um, 
expenditures by the university to produce multimedia. So if the university, even under our rules, even if the university uh, owns the work, uh, we still share the uh, revenue derived from external licensing because we want to motivate people to uh, continue to develop ideas and generate ideas. And it's, it's a good motivational tool to do so. However, it isn't neat and it isn't tidy and it can cause quite, when we get into multi-author projects, it can cause uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion about uh, what percentage belongs to, uh, to what contributor. Um, so the, that's kind of the good and bad of our system, but yet it seems to be one that is not uncommon in the academic setting, uh, but certainly sets us apart from the industry setting. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Um, I haven't hit all of the IP areas that we deal with, but because we are an active business as well as an uh, academic uh, setting, uh, we do find ourselves um, in lots of different IP areas. Um, I still find it a very gratifying area to, to practice in because uh, our clients are intelligent, hardworking, and with us collaboratively, we're all trying to uh, learn how to apply copyright law to the very best we can to help the university. Thanks everybody for your attention today. My name is Kate Early, and um, I'm from LexisNexis. I'm in the legal department there, and I think everybody knows who LexisNexis is, right? Big uh, legal publisher, do the online services, but we also have a very large uh, publishing house that has a lot of brands, like Matthew Bender uh, and, and a whole bunch of others. We're owned by Reed Elsevier, and Reed Elsevier also has
my business people have to make a decision then as to what they actually do. For instance, I may see somebody using uh, some of our content in a way that they don't have a permission for it and I know it's not fair use, right? Um, but do, do we go after them with a cease and desist? Do we just call them up and say, hey, stop that and take their word for it and then just kind of watch? What do we do, right? Because part of what you do will show up everywhere, right? The blogosphere, if somebody gets cranky, right? Word of mouth is really big among the academic circle. So you cannot be, you know, you gotta be the nice guy, you cannot be a jerk, um, uh, because that's part of your marketing. And also there are certain things you can go and offer them a permission, right? Say, hey, let's just go forward with the permission. Um, it all depends on what they're doing with that content. It's a balancing of the past. Again, you've got to balance what you do. It's not all about what rights you have and what you could enforce. Because I could go after them, yeah, in court, but is that going to be worth my time, money, and effort? So a lot of judgment goes into, into looking at those things that we do. The other thing I wanted to point out is, um, I think you all have heard this, but it's very important to remember, fair use is a defense to infringement, it is not a right, right? So we said again, defend, it's a, fair use is a defense to copyright infringement, it is not a right. It's very important to remember. Um, if you're going to a space and you're thinking, well, it, I want to use this as a fair use, well remember, you're going to have to prove that it was, um, it's going to meet those, those factors. So what do you do? When in doubt, when you're just not even sure, you don't even want to think, just go get a permission. So easy. As a publisher nowadays, it's my job to make it easy for you to get a permission. I think as, as we were talking about before, right? You go online to the publisher's website, you can usually fill in something there. Go to the Copyright Clearance Center, the CCC. You can go on there and you can get permission. And the CCC works this way. They don't send you the content, right? What they do is you fill out something, you give them your credit card, they charge you 25 cents page, whatever it is that the publisher said. And then you can go and you can copy it according to the license that you get from the Copyright Clearance Center. Okay? Really super, super duper easy. So really there's no excuse, right, for not getting a permission nowadays um, if you feel like you need it. Um, and then you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry at all. Permissions also are nice revenue for publishers if they charge for permissions. Some uh, publishers don't even charge. Some publishers just like to, uh, to have you get that permission, um, even when it's questionably fair use, so they want to give you that permission because they want to talk to you about their other publications that they have in the adjacent spaces, right? That you could market them, right? So it, 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 and for you, on the other side as a consumer, that would be something good for you to know. If there's another treatise that's actually better for me, I want to hear about that, right? Um, one of the things that always hit me as a professor that I always thought about was, oh my goodness, this just came out, this is a new topic, I want to talk all about the BP spill, whatever it was, in my business law class, right? So I found this article, oh, I want to talk about this tonight, right? Well, depending on how much of the article I use, it was the last minute, so I wasn't going to be able to go to the publisher and get that academic permission or whatever it is that I want to use. Okay, maybe I use it that time, but if I'm going to use it every time I teach that class from there on out, because I'm putting it in my syllabus, I'm going to the professor or going to the publisher after that. Okay, and that's part of, of the way uh, the the system has sort of evolved as far as helping us decide what is fair use in an academic setting. A lot of universities have really, really good, long, lengthy explanations about what they consider fair use right there on their website or in their manuals for uh, professors to see. I know at Wright State, for instance, we had uh, really long descriptions about like, if you're gonna use it this time, it's okay, but then after that, you have to get permissions, here's what you do, here's how the university can help you get that permission. Um, and regardless of fair use or whatever, these are the rules you're, gonna, you're going to follow. Uh, many times they may be more conservative than what fair use or the other rules may allow, but that's what the university wants you to do, and you're employed by the university, so thou shalt do what they want you to do, right? Um, one thing I have to think about a lot of times when uh, people bring me issues in the council 
about this is I have to think about the fact that even though I am a publisher, <coughs> I am a legal counsel for the publisher, um, authors have rights, right? Authors, even if I am uh, owning the copyright as a publisher, that author gets royalties. So am I going to enforce in this particular instance or that particular instance against somebody who may or may not be infringing, right? I have to think about the fact that this person's getting a you know 10% royalty or a 5% royalty or, or whatever, and this author brought it to me, right? So there's probably an expectation that I do something. I'm probably going to want to go back and report to that author how I handled that. So all of these things kind of go into, goes back into that sort of idea of the balancing test that I was talking about. Let's see what else. Uh, A, a little bit on the preventative measures. As we talked about before, I think in trademark, there are these companies that you can go out and you can hire as a publisher of uh, content to go out and police, or an author, to go out and police your content and make sure to see if anybody's in a friend thing. The other way to do it, uh, besides in your company, to do the same thing, right, is to be reactionary. Uh, and it's just a matter of how much risk you want to accept. Um, in that, in that space. The flip side of, of sort of like going and seeing who's infringing, right, is trying to prevent infringement in the first place through uh, digital rights management and licensing, right? So on digital rights management, I don't know if everybody's familiar with ebooks, right? So at Lexus, we have lots, 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 lots of ebooks. They're everywhere, right? They're on our website. You can, you can buy them, you can get them through Amazon. Everywhere. They have different DRM depending on what kind of, uh, whether they're through a distributor, like Amazon puts their own DRM on stuff, right? If they're on our site, we have different DRM. Uh, so DRM comes in different ways, right? It can be the Adobe DRM, the programmatic Adobe DRM. It can be the social DRM where it stamps, you know, uh, your uh, uh, email address at the top in the footer or the header. Of your your uh, so if you went and, and put that on uh, doc stock, then we could find that find it theoretically. Okay? Uh, or if you have no DRM, there's a lot of uh, publishers that are going to no DRM. I think you might have seen some of that if you're buying some things on Amazon. will say this publication has no DRM for the publisher, right? Um, those are all ways that we use to try and protect uh, our intellectual property. The other way to do it is. Even if no DRM, you still can have like a paragraph that licenses, that talks about the license that you get for that ebook. Ebooks are licensed, and they are not the same thing with the first sale doctrine of, of uh, books, print books, right? So we treat them much differently. That's a whole other uh, can of worms for another time um, and, uh, and whatnot. And I think the last thing that we do, a lot of publishers, especially big publishers like we are as we know so we're in the group, is we make sure that we are um, interacting with the Copyright Office. Copyright Office makes rules regarding copyright, right? And they talk about enforcement. You can go on their website. You can sign up for their little daily or weekly, I can't remember which it is, uh, emails. And they're really interesting to see what kind of things that Copyright Office is thinking about next as a rule. And you can go and comment and provide comments to the Copyright Office on what they should do or what you think they should do um, in their next steps. And so we do a lot of that to make sure that our input is heard, whether it's through, directly through us to the Copyright Office and some of those comments, or if it's through one of the uh, publishers' organizations that then comments uh, to those. So that way we can have an effect on what the next rules would be, because while the Copyright Office was in 1970s, or the Copyright Act, the last one, major one, was 1976, there have been iterations, little smaller amendments, if you will, I guess, in between, right? And they're talking already about the next new one, you know, 1919, 1976, and now we're talking about the next new one. So it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Um, and we want to be able to, to have our voice as one of the stakeholders uh, represented in that. So with that, it will be time for questions.
We have to try to, uh, at least five minutes for questions. I know we're running a little bit late, but uh, give folks a chance to ask at least a couple. Yes. Just a quick question uh, for uh, Professor Davis, um, and help me to understand. You had said something about that oral speech can be uh, copyright protected if it is delineated. Yes. Can you uh, and help me understand what, what it means to be delineated? And well, no court has really. Uh, what the courts have said, uh, and it's all um, dictum so far, is that the part of the oral speech that you want to be protected has to be somehow identified from the ordinary course of conversation. So uh, it needs to have a beginning and an end, if you will, and the person who's seeking that protection has to indicate what the beginning and the end is, what it is that's being protected versus <coughs> ordinary conversation. And, and does that oral speech has to be, does it have to be subsequently recorded? No. And fixed, does it? No, it does not. So far. Who knows what the courts will say because they haven't actually recognized this form of protection yet. Just everybody assumes they will. What rules they attach to it, if, if and when they ever get to it, we don't know. Beyond delineation, of course. Yes. Uh, yes, this one is also Professor <coughs> Davis. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about course syllabi being protected. And my question, being having been out of college for a long time, uh, Professor owns the copyright. Uh, I mean, this sounds silly, but why would anyone hire somebody on the basis of courses when he takes here? Because um, you know, the employers can't see what the, the students have been taught. Copying the uh, syllabi would probably not fall under fair use as you find it because there's no use exception for getting a job. You're copying the entire syllabus or maybe more than one of them for that matter, 100% of the quantity. Uh, you're profiting in a way from copying and getting a job. And it's not for scholarship or research. So why, why, why would uh, a university uh, try to allow the professors to maintain a copyright on a syllabi? And it's essentially when it seems that it would be an essential thing to demonstrate to a potential employer or students that is teaching the right things in the right way. The uh, <clears throat> university has the authority in its employment contracts to require professors to assign the copyrights in the syllabi to the university. I don't know that very many do that, but they certainly have the power to do it. Uh, secondly, um, the professor wants the copyright uh, to avoid something that happened here once. Uh, it was not controversial, but we had a professor in the estates and trusts area and property area at one time who gave essentially the same lecture every year and the students wrote it down and sold it to each other. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure the, uh, the professor was particularly happy about that. Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he thought that way the students would get the accurate scoop on what they were supposed to know in the course. But some other professors I know in this school have forbidden students from recording their lectures. And so, the copyright is essential to the professor's controlling recording of their lectures. Uh, that's the oral stuff. And the professors may not want to have the syllabi uh, become commercialized uh, without their participating in it. Well, there are students who 
go in the business of selling class notes to other students. One more question. One more quick question. Uh, so in academic writing, well, in, the, in the medical literature, we might compile a textbook chapter that may be in print or online that could include 200 references. And among them, we might even want to include 50 modified graphs or explanations of data that exist from other papers. And it's traditional that you get well, permission from all of those authors. And based on the fair use, wouldn't that be covered in fair use, especially with regard to the fact that we are specifically commenting, teaching, and researching on that particular piece of information within all of the context of the same work? So uh, some of those practices do vary by field and industry. Uh, and I think what you have there is essentially avoiding the whole analysis of fair use by getting those permissions, which I think is a good approach, particularly uh, where, where a, a fair amount of material or an entire graph or chart uh, is being reproduced. Uh, but in general, uh, in, if you're doing scholarly work and you're quoting from prior pieces and you're uh, limiting the amount you're taking, that's generally the kind of thing that can qualify under the fair use defense and in a lot of fields uh, that can be done and is done without the permissions. Uh, but the, it's that challenge that the more you take, the more of an issue you might have. And particularly, if in order to comment on that work, you really have to uh, <coughs> capture a good bit of it. Uh, that's where the permission is a very good idea. And, and do you want to pay for the do you want to pay for the litigation to find out whether you are right or wrong on fair use? Yeah, you don't. You right. don't. Every <laughs> journal is going to be different too, because you know some journals are done completely free and not for profit, so that changes your analysis a little bit and your factors and your balancing. Um, and then, but most have some sort of economic component to them. Whether you know even open access journals sometimes have some sort of economic component to them. So you you, you have to. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to go into that whole process of litigating. Charts are particularly uh, problematic sometimes in that analysis in that they can be argued to have taken away the value for someone then wanting to buy that work. And that's a big part of fair use as, as well, is how much of, of it are you using is not just a, tw if people ask me this all the time, they say, Kate, how much can I quote in the book or take how much can my author take, right, and put in the book? Is it 50 words? Is it 10 words? Is it 10%? The Georgia State case, oh, a lot of people, you know, they, let's be honest, they freaked out because when they saw the lower court's opinion, they were like, great, oh my gosh, they've done a, a clear, bright line test now on how much some people can take, and what does this mean for us, right? And so when that was overturned, now we gotta go, people are not as, not as concerned about that because they're, they're thinking that that will be taken into account. The reaction that a lot of people in the, in the blogosphere and in the legal community had will be taken into account uh, on the, the remand. But we'll see, right? But there is no how much can you take. But one of the things we always tell people to think about is how much of that other work are you preventing people, are you taking such that someone might not need to buy that other work, right? And just one, one final point on that Georgia State case. If the lower court had been followed on the appeal, it would have made everyone's life simpler because it said you can copy 10% or one chapter out of a book. But the uh, court on appeal said, no, that's the wrong approach. It's too mechanical. And that's very consistent with really all the Supreme Court cases that say it's case by case balancing. And that's what leads to the litigation. And that's why it's hard to rely on. All right, we're going to take a, a break right here, and uh, please get lunch, and we'll come back for the keynote.